Let's see what results when we equate a couple of familiar equations. Recall that acceleration equals delta V over delta T. Also recall that the acceleration is equal to F over M, Newton's second law. Let's equate the two acceleration equations. Multiplying both sides by M delta T, we get F delta T equals M delta V. Or we can say F delta T equals delta MV, which happens to be an intriguing relationship. The quantity F delta T is called impulse, or letting delta T simply be T for the time interval, we can say impulse equals FT, which is read impulse equals force F exerted on an object multiplied by the time it acts T. The quantity MV is called momentum, which is inertia and motion. A massive object at rest has inertia, but no inertia of motion, which is to say, no momentum. But apply a force to it, and it acquires momentum. Better said, apply an impulse to an object, and it will undergo a change in momentum. Impulse equals change in momentum. Or in symbol form, FT equals delta MV. We say the impulse exerted on an object changes the momentum of the object. FT equals delta MV is called the impulse-momentum relationship. Both impulse and momentum of vector quantities, direction matters. We can apply this relationship to the unfortunate situation of being in a car that goes out of control and is brought to a halt by a collision. In any case, the impulse of the collision will bring your momentum to zero. Suppose the collision is with a haystack. Then the impulse, force times time, is mostly in time, which is a good thing. Note the long time means a small force for a given impulse. But suppose the collision is with a stone wall. Whoops! Here the impulse is mostly force because the time during which the impulse occurs is short. Big F T equals delta M V. So minimum force occurs when the time of contact is long. No matter how the car is stopped, the impulse F T is the same. In boxing, consider the momentum of an incoming punch. When the boxer moves away from the punch, he extends the time of contact and diminishes the force. Big T means small f. When he moves into the glove, the time is reduced and he must withstand a greater force. Small t means big F. In our next lesson, we'll see that if there's no net impulse on an object, then its momentum will not change. I want to leave you with a question. When you were lucky enough to catch a fly ball with your bare hand while watching a baseball game, less damage to your hand occurs if you begin your catch with your hand extended toward the incoming ball so there's space to gradually pull your hand and ball backward. In terms of impulse momentum, explain why this is so. Until next time, good energy. during which the impulse occurs is short. Big F T equals delta M V. So minimum force occurs when the time of contact is long. No matter how the car is stopped, the impulse F T is the same. In boxing, consider the momentum of an incoming punch. When the boxer moves away from the punch, he extends the time of contact and diminishes the force. Big T means small f. When he moves into the glove, the time is reduced and he must withstand a greater force. Small T means big F. 
In our next lesson, we'll see that if there's no net impulse on an object, then its momentum will not change. I want to leave you with a question. When you were lucky enough to catch a fly ball with your bare hand while watching a baseball game, less damage to your hand occurs if you begin your catch with your hand extended toward the incoming ball so there's space to gradually pull your hand and ball backward. In terms of impulse momentum, explain why this is so. Until next time, good energy. The impulse momentum relationship tells us that when an impulse is exerted on an object, a change in the object's momentum occurs. So you know that if you exert an impulse on a stationary grocery cart, the cart will gain momentum. Or if you exert an impulse on the cart while it's moving, you'll further change its momentum. Let's refine this a bit. The impulse that changes the momentum of something has to be an external impulse. Only an external impulse changes momentum. If you sit in an automobile and push on the dashboard, the dashboard pushes back on you. There is no net impulse and no change in net momentum. Internal impulses always cancel. To make the auto gain momentum, you'd have to get outside and push from outside. Only an external impulse changes momentum. Now here's the interesting part. If no external impulse is exerted on the auto, no change in momentum occurs. None. No change in momentum means that a stationary auto remains stationary and a moving auto continues in whatever motion it has. The same is true for cars, grocery carts, or whatever. No impulse, no change in momentum. This relates to inertia in Newton's first law. Now consider a cannon being fired. Let's look at a snapshot of the ball part way down the barrel. While a force pushes the cannonball, an equal and opposite force pushes back on the cannon, which causes its recoil. Since this pair of equal and opposite forces occur for the same length of time, the impulses are also equal and opposite. So, impulses relate to Newton's third law. This pair of impulses is internal to the system consisting of the cannon and the cannonball. Internal impulses don't change the momentum of the system. Before firing, the system's at rest and the momentum is zero. After the firing, the net momentum, or total momentum, is still zero. You can imagine the cannon recoiling somewhat to the left with the same amount of momentum as the cannonball. Net momentum is neither gained nor lost. So we see the cannonball's momentum is mainly velocity, while the cannon's momentum is mainly mass. So although both the cannonball and cannon each have momentum, in the combined cannon-cannonball system, and being vector quantities, they cancel to zero. We say total momentum is unchanged, zero before firing and zero after firing. In any interaction where no external impulse is exerted, momentum remains unchanged. We say momentum is conserved. We call this the conservation of momentum. In the absence of an external impulse or external force, the momentum of a system remains unchanged. Momentum conservation and the role of systems are nicely illustrated in the game of pool. I think we've all marveled how a cue ball comes to a halt when it collides head-on with a stationary eight ball, transferring its motion to the eight ball. When contact is made, Consider the system consisting only of the eight ball, the eight ball system. When a cue ball strikes, there's an external force on the eight ball, which then gains momentum. 
Let's look at this from the point of view of the cue ball system. When the cue ball strikes the eight ball, a reaction forced by the eight ball, which is external to the cue ball system, changes the momentum of the cue ball. It brings the cue ball to a halt. Now let's look at this from the point of view of the combined eight ball cue ball system. In this larger system, the forces we've considered are internal forces. No external force acts on the system. So there is no net change in the system's momentum. The momentum before the collision was mv, and the momentum after the collision is still mv. Momentum has simply transferred from the cue ball to the eight ball. The Q and 8 ball illustrate an elastic collision. That's one in which colliding objects rebound without lasting deformation or heat generation. And then there's inelastic collisions, where colliding objects become distorted and or generate heat during the collision and possibly stick together. Here's the important thing. Momentum is conserved in all collisions, whether they are elastic or inelastic, so long as no external forces act during the brief period of collision. I want to leave you with a question. Suppose a freight train car rolls along a track at 10 meters per second and collides with an identical freight car of the same mass at rest. The two cars couple together and move as one along the track. How fast do the couple cars move? Think about that. Until next time, good energy. Here's an inelastic collision problem that begs for a solution by way of momentum conservation. A five kilogram fish swims at one meter per second toward and swallows a smaller one kilogram fish at rest. Find the velocity of the larger fish immediately after lunch. Ignore the effects of water resistance. Since there's no outside forces acting on the two fish system, we know that the net momentum before lunch will be equal to the net momentum after lunch. Following the physics, the initial momentum of the large fish is five kilograms times one meter per second Add this to the initial momentum of the small fish, which is zero. After lunch, the net momentum is the combined mass times V, what we're looking for. Continuing. And canceling kilograms. We see that the velocity after lunch is 5, 6 meters per second. This velocity is in the same direction as the initial velocity of the large fish. We employ the conservation of momentum and come to a solution. Yum! Suppose the small fish is not at rest but swims toward the left at 4 meters per second. Find the velocity of the larger fish immediately after lunch. Again, ignore the effects of water resistance. As before, the net momentum before lunch equals the net momentum after lunch. We have the initial momentum of the large fish plus the initial momentum of the small fish with velocity equal to minus 4 meters per second. And after lunch, we have the combined mass times the velocity v that we're looking for. So we see the initial momentum is 5 kilograms meters per second minus 4 kilograms meters per second in negative direction relative to the large fish, which equals 6 kilograms times V. Combining terms and canceling kilograms, we find V equals 1 sixth meters per second. What happens here is the negative momentum of the small fish effectively slows the large fish after lunch. Suppose the smaller fish was swimming twice as fast at 8 meters per second. 
Then we make use of our prior calculations, changing minus 4 meters per second to minus 8 meters per second. Here we see the final velocity is minus one half meter per second. What's the significance of the minus sign? After lunch, the two fish system moves backward toward the left. Yum yum physics, at least according to the large fish. I want to leave you with a question. How fast would the small fish have to swim before lunch to halt the large fish in its tracks? That is, what speed brings the net momentum to zero? Until next time, good energy. Here's a question that involves a bit of insight and a nice application of some good physics. Freddy Frog drops vertically from a tree onto a horizontally moving skateboard. The skateboard slows. Give two reasons for the slowing. One in terms of force and the other in terms of momentum conservation. In terms of force, we have to ask what force acts on Freddy after dropping and making contact with a skateboard. More specifically, what horizontal force acts on him? Freddy drops vertically with no horizontal component of motion. But when he lands on the skateboard, he is brought up to a speed at which he and the skateboard then move on. A horizontal gain in speed means a horizontal force. What kind of force could this be? Did you say friction? Do you mean friction between Freddy's feet and the surface of the skateboard? I hope so. If there were no friction, say in dropping onto a perfectly slippery board, Freddy wouldn't be able to stay on the board and ride with it. Without friction, he'd slip off the board upon contact. So the force on Freddy's feet must be a friction force. Agree? But we're talking about the friction force that carries Freddy to the right. Is this the force that slows the skateboard? Not really. But what does Newton's third law say about forces? That they act in pairs? And by action-reaction, the force of the board on Freddy to the right has an equal and opposite force by Freddy on the board to the left? Yes! Freddy exerts a force on the board to the left. That's minus F to show the direction to the left. This reaction force is what slows the skateboard. So I erase the vector that represents the force on Freddy. And we have the answer to the first part of our question, that a briefly acting force of friction slows the board. Yum! Now let's answer the question about slowing in terms of momentum conservation. Since no external force acts in the horizontal direction of our Freddy and skateboard system, can we say that momentum of the board before Freddy lands on it must be the same amount of momentum after the skateboard catches Freddy? I hope you said yes to this question. Because with no external force acting on the Freddy skateboard system, momentum before Freddy lands is equal to momentum after with Freddy. Since the mass with Freddy is greater, the same momentum means the velocity must decrease. The skateboard has to slow down if it carries Freddy. So we've solved the second part of our question. One of the yum things about physics is the variety of ways to answer questions and solve problems. Let's put some numbers in Freddy and the skateboard. Suppose both the skateboard and Freddy have masses of one kilogram. Let's keep the numbers simple so the concepts are clear. Suppose also that the initial speed of the skateboard is one meter per second. Again, simple numbers. Then the momentum before Freddy's drop is one kilogram, one meter per second, is one kilogram meter second. 
after Freddy's drop, it's still one kilogram meter second. Question. How fast must twice the mass move for the same momentum of one kilogram meter second? I think you can see the board with Freddy moves at half speed, one half meter per second. Yum physics? I want to leave you with a question. Suppose the situation is the same, but Freddy's mass is two kilograms. What is the speed of the skateboard when Freddy lands on it and takes a ride? Until next time, good energy. Here's a nice application of momentum and energy conservation. The classic ballistic pendulum problem. Here's the setup. Wishing to find the velocity of a high-speed bullet, we fire it into a block of wood suspended by a pair of strings. The block is large enough to completely swallow the bullet, whereupon it swings by supporting strings upward. The faster the bullet, the higher the block will swing to an elevation h that is easily measured. We also know the masses of the bullet and the block. This is how the velocities of bullets were measured in the old days. Today, this still makes a yum problem in physics labs, not with bullets, but with metal balls. What do we want to find? We want to find the velocity of the fired bullet. So to begin, off on the hard part of the problem, we write V equals. We use a big V symbol because we know the velocity is high. V equals what? Can we say the kinetic energy of the bullet, which contains the V we're looking for, will equal the potential energy to which the block is raised? If so, that would be simple and we could say kinetic energy of the bullet equals potential energy of the block? And one half m big V square equals m plus m, the both m's, times gh? We can say that solving for v is easy enough. But we can't go that route. Why? Because the kinetic energy of the bullet does more than raise the block, much more. The high-speed bullet appreciably heats the block while it slams to rest inside. You wouldn't want to put your bare finger into the bullet hole of the block before it cooled. So our energy equation would be kinetic energy of the bullet equals heating of the block plus the potential energy of the block. We don't have information that deals with the heat generated. That being the case, we move to the conservation of momentum. For this is a collision problem that bypasses heating or other forms of energy. By that we mean that the momentum of the fired bullet before colliding with a block equals the momentum of the block with its embedded bullet immediately after the collision, regardless of any heat generated. Heat is an energy thing, not a momentum thing. So we write this as mv equals big M times m times little v, where little m is the mass of the bullet, big V is the bullet's velocity, what we're looking for, big M is the mass of the block, and little v is the velocity of the block with a bullet immediately after collision. So, we see that big V equals the sum of the masses over the little mass times little v. Problem solved? Not quite. We don't know the velocity of the block with its embedded bullet. That's the small symbol v. The equation tells us that we must find v. But how? Aha! We switch our attention to the conservation of energy. Why? Because the kinetic energy of the block, whether heated or not, transfers to potential energy. So the initial kinetic energy of the block upon absorbing the fired bullet 
will equal the potential energy of the block at the top of its swing. We write this as kinetic energy bottom equals potential energy top or one half mass combination times little v squared equals mass combination times gh where g is the acceleration due to gravity and h is the measured height to which the block rises and guess what folks the v in this equation the initial velocity of the block is what we're looking for solving for v we find Taking the square root of both sides and solving for v only leads us to v equals square root of 2gh. Aha, is this fun or what? Now we substitute this in our equation above. Now our problem is solved for all the symbols represent known quantities. We know the masses and the height the block rises. You may do this in lab. Then you can put numbers in. In my experience, the raw physics is best seen with its symbols. Solving problems with symbols only may take a bit of getting used to if all the problem solving you've had in the past was numerical. Are we learning? That's the most important thing. Let me leave you with this question. If the same mass bullet were fired at twice the speed into the block, how much higher would the block swing? Until next time, good energy and good momentum. <laughs>